like, I mean, while the internet gods are with us, I would love, um, so Khan, um, I don't like, I, I don't want to start with like, what was the first moment you wanted to, you thought about doing the book? Like, I want us to get into it. Okay, here. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Okay, oh, he's, he's already trying to like get me off the screen. Okay, so what was the moment in your book journey where you were like, I am not doing this anymore. I can't do it. I want to quit. I have I have a full time job. Like I want to hear the the moment. You know, this happened. I would say, um, uh, like every week. Like literally, I think every week. And the only reason this thing got done was because I have a partner, fiance, I, I have my fiance Wesley, who's just every week would not let me fail, would not let me quit, um, because it was an incredibly draining experience. Um, and I don't. Um, it, every week I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I During want a specific before. moment. Yeah. During the proposal process, there was a, you know, during the proposal process, which took about four months to finish, I, I as I looked at the overview and I looked at the arc of the book, I was like, I, I don't know if there is, if I can make it work. I don't know if I can, like, what, okay, I have, I have the first half of the book here. Like, what, what do we do? How do we get to the end? Um, I, you know, and then even as we went through the process of writing the book, I was like, you know, I can't do, I don't want to reconnect with my parents. You know what? I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. I have a happy life here or blah, blah, blah. And the, so there's, there were several steps of the way where I just didn't think even after the book manuscript was finished, I was like, you know, no one's going to read this. No one's going to care. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, what if everyone hates this, you know, let's not release this. Uh, and, and there's just so much self doubt throughout the process that is very, um, uh, you know, crippling at times. But, uh, but like, you know, right. Cause for those of you who don't know, Aaron wrote one of my, actually, I should tell you this right now while we're doing this is that Aaron wrote a book. Um, uh, all I ever wanted, correct. Is the exact title. All that you leave behind. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. All I ever wanted is a different book that I just wrote this month. Sorry. I'm getting too confused. You wrote this beautiful memoir about your father and your book was one of two books I read in the course of writing my book. I mean, that I read very closely. One was Born a Crime by Trevor Noah and your book. And what really struck out about your book and why it gave me strength to finish mine was because it was just so raw and there, it was so unvarnished. And I was like, okay, if Erin Lee Carr can do this with her, this journey with her father, then I can do this with, with mine. And so it was very much, I mean, your, your book gave me the strength to finish mine. And I, 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 I very much, you know, so how did I get through it? I, you know. Hey, you did it, right? I had a little bit of help though. I had help with my father. I mean, um, you know, I think the my book specifically is about New York Times writer David Carr, um, incredible writer, thinker, um, father, mentor. And he sent me these letters, uh, basically how to live life. It was an instructional instructional manual. And so like, how could I not put those things together? But when I think about your book and I think you should, you know, set it up. I think um, Adam, you know, was going into it, but it's, it's just like, you, you're there alone. It's really about you sort of processing what tension is, what anger is, what family is, what loyalty is. So, yeah, I mean, I would love your sort of yeah. uh, ex explanation on the book, like, you know, uh, on the yeah. book and what so was going on. So the book, uh, so my, my parents got arranged to get married in the 1970s, but they had a really toxic arranged marriage. Um, very toxic. Um, uh, so, but because of South Asian culture, they didn't get divorced for about 30 years. So in the course of that 30 years, they had these two kids. Um, so growing up, I knew nothing about them. I didn't know how old they were. I didn't know uh, how they met. I didn't know how they came to this country, what they were like as kids what our extended family was like. I didn't know anything, very basic facts. Big facts, little facts, I didn't know anything about them. Um, and so what the book does, it tracks this year of my life as I try to find them. As I began writing the book, I did not know where they were living. Um, over the course of that year, I go to India and reconnect with my father who I hadn't seen in 11 years. And I go to New Jersey to see my mom who I hadn't spoken to in like four, four or five years, whatever, whatever the number is. But it had been several years. And, in, you know, I asked them all the questions that I didn't get to do when I was growing up or didn't do. And, and it's a lot, the book has a lot to do with, you know, a lot of things immigrant kids are familiar with, you know, lack of communication at home, um, you know, assimilation, all that kind of stuff. And separately, it's also about forgiveness and healing and also about, you know, I want to give my parents a voice. I think a lot of um, 
children of immigrant stories end up kind of uh, throwing shade at the generation before us. And I didn't want this book to be that. I want it to be as nuanced, as nuanced a portrayal as it was, as it can be. And so, you know, that meant a lot of difficult conversations, but also I wanted to give them the space to tell their story, you know, where they came from. Literally my first question to both of my parents as we sat at in the kitchen was, uh, how old are you? When's your birthday? Cause I didn't know. And so, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's a long winded way of telling you what the book's about. Well, I'm, what I'm interested in also is, um, so you were, um, you had a, you have a girlfriend now fiance, um, but it was like, there was something very special about like inviting her and introducing her to the family that made it sort of, um, that made it exist. You know, it wasn't as awkward because finally there was somebody new in the equation, um, that it was like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm teaching, I'm doing this for dinner and I'm figuring this out and this is what my mom likes and this is what my dad likes. Like it almost as if the relationship um, provided a buffer point. Yeah. Well, Wesley and I, uh, who, who is somewhere near here by, um, Wesley and I were able to experience this journey together because we were both experiencing things for the first time. Like it was also my first trip to India, right? So we were seeing everything. So when I saw the Taj Mahal for the first time, uh, Wesley saw the Taj Mahal for the first time, and we both saw a lot of things for the first time, and that was that was really it was great to share that with someone. But you know, also Wesley's willingness to kind of come along for the journey—that's not everybody would do that, right? Like, not everybody is a lot. I think a lot of partners, not a lot, some partners would be like, "Oh, that's I'm not. I didn't sign up for this. This is not." Well, um, we're in a, a serious uh, relationship, and I'm going to write about it in a book. Yeah, like, right. that's hard. Right. To tell, like, if I was started dating someone, it'd be like, hmm, that's great. Good luck with that. Yeah, right. And and Wesley, Wesley's first reaction wasn't, uh, what? It was, how can I help? In fact, it was more, it was actually went beyond that. It was like, okay, let's take the laptop out and begin. Here's my ideas for a proposal. You know, it went beyond, it went beyond, um, you know, just acquiescing to the journey. She instantly became a part of it. And it's funny. Um, a lot of people read the book and they go, wow, Wesley is incredible. Well, yeah, she's the moral center of the book. She's the moral center of my life. But the other people that love Wesley more than I, but then, then people like me in the course of the book are my parents. My parents like Wesley way more than they like me. And I don't blame them. But she is very much a, a moderating influence on, on all, all the characters in the book. They all like her, you know? And you guys all, too, all, all would too if you guys met her. And what... I mean, I had a, a specific experience, um, and this is not to call him out, um, but I had an ex-boyfriend. I was writing my book, and it's it was it's a disturbing book because it's about death and all this stuff. And I said, you know, I need your help reading chapters. And he was just like, I can't do this. Like, I can't do this every night with you. Like, I'm I'm oh, happy you're writing the book, but I just um, I can't be with you every night on this. And it was one of those moments. Where I was like, this is just not the right person for me. Um, and and, and that, that, yeah, right yeah. there's no right because you 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 especially are an inherently creative person, fueled by you know creative projects, and that means at all hours of the day you're thinking about this kind of stuff. This is what's on your mind. I'm the same way. I get it. And uh, if you have someone who is with you who is not who doesn't get that who doesn't get that sometimes it's every night. You know, it's a, it doesn't work. And Wesley, it's a burden though, but yeah. isn't it a burden? Sure. I mean, that's part of the yeah, it is. Um, but that's part of the deal. Um, I will say there are times where the times I kind of regret, or when I'd be like, <laughs> there's one time uh, during the, in the course of the book writing process where I had a little bit of a like a freak out because a, early on in the manuscript process, or you know, a little bit midway through, there was a fact in the book, halfway through the book that was incorrect and change a tenor of an entire chapter. And I thought, oh my God, the whole book is ruined. So I wake Wesley up and it's like 1.30 in the morning and I'm, I'm losing, I'm like, Wesley, this whole book, like it's ruined. I can't, you know, like, you know, it doesn't make sense because the rest of all, I'm just having like a meltdown and Wesley like, all right, I'll get up, calms me down and says, and then like, like within a half hour, we fixed the problem. And then she like went back to bed. And, and also keep in mind, Wesley's a corporate lawyer. Like this is what she does on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's already like an 80 to 100 hour a week job. And on top of that, she's helping me with this project and plus going on this very emotional journey with me. So I'm very grateful to that. So this is our relationship podcast for yeah. everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the uh, love. This is like how Sopan is uh, very lucky in love and I'm very unlucky in love. Yeah. So like 
we just create really good foil for each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not expect this uh, book talk to turn into modern love, but I'm, you know, whatever I'm here. Um, and so let's talk about you navigating the realities of writing about people in real time. I think um, a lot of people, I think I love reading memoir, but I think anybody who is uh, thinking about writing a book, I think it's just something that really doesn't as much get talked about. So I'd love to sort of hear how you navigated that. Um, man, you know, I had to approach this as detached as possible. And what I mean by that is, my, I, when I first started this, I, I looked at my, I, I, I approached it as a journalist would because um, I want to approach it as passionately and without preconceived notions. Because I think if I went at my parents as this aggrieved child of immigrants, they would have gotten defensive really early. I would have gotten angry really early. And it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been a productive discussion. So I had to go at them and just be as unbiased. And, and, and what this causes you to do is it forces you to look in the mirror. Because look, you know, in terms of why our family disintegrated when we were younger, um, as far as why that is, look, we all played a part. You know, I was I wasn't the best son I could have been at times, and like in in, in the course of falling out with my mom and dad in the course of my twenties, you know, that's a two way street. You know, you know that's that not so interesting. I really was. Um unnerved by your um, sort of reaction to that. Like you were somebody that was in high school that was in a destabilized home. You were uh, around, you were just trying to figure out who you were as a person. Like when you say that, and you say that a lot in the book that it's like a two way street, I understand the adulthood, but like as a kid, you could not fix them. And like, do you take, why do you take ownership of their problems? I don't take full ownership. I take slight ownership. Um, you know, and I don't I, I agreed. I don't think, you know, children are to blame for, you know, the shortcomings of their parents. But I also, you know, think that there was some responsibility I had. But, but it's most but most of the kind of responsibility, quote unquote, that I take is mostly for the adult side. Mm. You know, because I don't think it should have taken me till I was 30 to have the conversations with my parents. I, I mean, I don't know. I have not seen my mom in 17 years. And I just, I think that there is something, obviously it's so amazing that you reconnected, but there is something to be said about um, having boundaries. And it's like the- and, it's not, and this is not for, yeah, this is not for everybody. And, the, and, and I would say like, you know, the people, some parents do unforgivable things. And I'm not saying that's the case for your mother. I'm saying, generally speaking, hey mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, 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 for you. Some people do things, you know, that you know. Sometimes estrangement's a healthy thing. I'm not saying that's that's it's that's true. But what I do think that I don't I I don't believe I gave my parents a proper chance in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And whether that stems from their you know distance from me growing up or my you know, whatever, you know, I do think I could have given them more of a chance growing up. I definitely could have given them more of my attention once I became an adult. And in my twenties, I'm navigating a bunch of different, different things. And so, um, and why didn't you, I know that you, we don't want to sort of synthesize or simplify your book into these sort of these core statements, but I think that it is like, I remember reading about your, like, you know, basically you tell me about the book and that you had not really spoken in 10 years. Like that is pretty atypical. Yeah. Um, you know, what it, it's like, what, you know, what was that like sort of figuring that those moments out? So the answer to your first part of your question is, um, why didn't I, I, you know, I didn't think about them at all, barely because, or, or if I did, it, there's a kind of deep, deep gnawing at me that I didn't have a relationship with them. But the truth is we barely spoke growing up. We didn't have a lot of dinners together. Um, it's funny, you know, when I was reading your book, like you talk about these, you know, times when you're out with your father and you guys are sharing, you're getting emails from your father about like, Hey, I love this piece you wrote, or here's my advice for how to get a job or whatever. I never had that with my dad growing up. We never played catch together. We never, we never, um, you know, we, we never did those things together. Um, so when I got to college and post-college, they were just, did you, did you ever have a college roommate that you were just kind of 
didn't speak to you just kind of lived together and like that was it like that was the only point of contact you had i that's was able to yeah push her out of the the room and i got <laughs> to myself it was the truly one of the most maniacal things i've ever done in that's my pretty life good. you know i you know i had a roommate um uh in my 20s uh in 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 new york in harlem uh nina who who we we lived together for several years and we we would talk a lot of nights and it was great i didn't have that growing up with my parents whereas they're in Oh my gosh, you on this? I had no idea. Sorry. Hi, Nina. I did not know you were on this. That's cool. Anyway, um, but we, so Nina and I spoke quite a bit, whereas it, when I was growing up, it was a very empty household. And so when we kind of fell apart, there was nothing to fall apart from. So I didn't think about our estrangement much on a day-to-day -day basis until I got to my late twenties, early thirties, where I was like, they might die without, without you knowing their story, you know? And I didn't want them I didn't want. I didn't want to. I didn't want them to pass away without me knowing. There's like giving us a chance on some level. Do you? Um, did you go through a lot of therapy to write this book? No, I did see a therapy a therapist for multiple years in my twenties, and, and and I I would I I didn't stop seeing one for any other reason other than I just I think I started covering the Trump campaign, so I was on the road for a couple years. And, uh, and I just never got back to it after that. And that's not because I don't want to, it's just, I think everyone should see a therapist. I, um, most of my therapy sessions were really focused on like my love life. And in hindsight, that was a complete, completely, complete misuse of my time when I really should probably spend it talking about my parents more, you know, it was a, it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit odd use of my time, I think. Um, a lot of people, you know, some people reach out to me and they say, what are the sort of core tenets of getting through a book? And I was like, <laughs> I had to double down on therapy specifically for mine. Really? So how um, do you think that helped? Hmm? How do you, so like, why did you feel you needed the therapy? So it was about processing. So um, there was uh, obviously in memoir, you're writing about the good, the bad and the ugly and there's a lot of, you, you mentioned the word self-doubt. I mean, I could not think of a phrase that more embodies the writing process, specifically when you're a young author trying to write about yourself. Every single page you have a, well, nobody gives a fuck about this. This is boring. And so I think, but like, you've been assigned to do this and you have to turn it in. Um, I mean, yeah. Deadlines are real, man. Deadlines Did you turn your book in on time? Turn it, turn it in four months ahead of time this guy. I think that deserves a medal. Um, I think a lot of people are really interested in how do you, how do you get a book sold? Like you don't have to sort of talk about the proprietary sure. stuff, but we would love to know about like how you sold this book, what you learned, like how do we get into the, yeah. the pragmatic stuff? Uh, so I actually been pretty public about it because I posted my book proposal on Twitter, but, um, and, and Instagram and all that stuff. It's pretty easy to find. Um, but basically, you know, Wesley and I put together a proposal that took about four months and the book proposal has like, you know, a, a curtain raiser, a book overview, chapter overviews, author bio, marketing, which is like what the most important thing is, and um, and chapter some, and a couple of sample chapters. And then, you know, your book agent shops that and, um, and then a couple of people ask for meetings and then- How important is a book agent? Like, and how do you find a book agent? So, uh, there are three ways to find a book agent. They either, A, they, they think you have an interesting story, they approach you. Uh, B, you cold email or cold get in touch with a book agent. Or three, in my case, I was represented already by CAA for like, for like TV and film and whatever else. And so I went to the, my CAA quote unquote handler and I went to her and said, hey, I have a book idea. Do you guys have someone who does books? And they put me in touch with the book agent and then he helped, helped me with the proposal throughout the process. Uh, but that's that's a little bit, um, that's not for everybody. Uh, I just have to be very fortunate in that respect. Um, uh, but, you know, so, you know, I have a friend that cold emailed an agent with, you know, he, she's been writing a novel and, you know, now, now has a now has an agent and they're gonna sh start shopping a novel. And, you know, so it can, it, there's no blueprint to it. There's multiple ways. And sometimes you don't need an agent. Sometimes you can just, you know, if you have, if you, but that means you have to know somebody, you have to know a book editor. editor. And sometimes it happens like that. And what was it like the, let's walk into your head the day that you sold um, the book to Day Street and Harper Collins, like, can you put us in that room with you? Like, yeah, yeah I wanna hear about that. Uh, I was at work at the New York Times building. Um, an agent called me, uh, Wesley was on speakerphone. And I remember being really excited because 
you know, I'm like, I'm 30 years old and two and four years prior, I was unemployed thinking that I was, ha I was going to be out of the business. And uh, if Nina's still on here, Nina, Nina lived through several unemployment battles with me, I think. Um, and so I got from that to being a New York Times writer with a book deal, um, but also with a lot of nervousness about how the next two years were going to go. And I was putting a lot of pressure on myself because I'll tell you what, being a Brown writer, I think is different than um, the, you know, being a person of color, you know, making, trying to, trying to make it in the publishing world is, is a little bit different because, you know, I didn't want the next person. I don't want the next like person who is a, you know, a Brown person who has a story to tell and then being like, you know, we tried this with SoPan and it flopped. So I put, like, I put a little extra pressure on myself, you know, to make this good because I just didn't want this, you know, because there's, it's so much harder to get bought, you know, have, have a publisher put resources behind you, um, you know, have critics pay attention to you, um, you know, and so I, I, I put a little bit of pressure on myself to do well and, and, and promote it as much as possible because, you know, I want, I, I think it's really important that we get more of these stories. I, I think this is, this is not the South Asian story. It's one of many South Asian stories, but it's only a couple that make it out there into the lexicon. I hope that others happen in the meantime, um, whether it's because of my book or whatever, but I, I just didn't want this to be a failure. You know what I mean? And um, that's a good segue to my next thing. You know, I, I remember reading in your book about sort of feeling othered um, and surrounded by white people in high school and trying to sort of like, you know, um, disentangle yourself from your own identity. Um, is that what media feels like? Is that what writing a book is feels like? You're just surrounded by white people? Uh, well, the thing about writing a book is that you're mostly doing it by yourself at home, right? And um, so I didn't really, my book editor, this guy, Matt Dona, he's white. And he, and I, I, I'll be perfectly honest. Like at first I was like, man, like having a white person edit this book, I don't know. But, and then he just, kicked ass and he consistently elevated the writing. So I never really felt it in those moments. And at the end of the day, Harper Collins, you know, invested in the book. So, you know, um, and which I'm very grateful for. So um, I never felt it that much in the book process, writing process. I definitely felt it growing up, right? Because it, that's when you're writing a book, that's, that's a two year process. Growing up is, you know, 18, 21 year, Fit, uh, a 21 year process. So, you know, when I was growing up, I'd, I'd be surrounded by kid, kids that didn't look like me. And that was like every year. Right. And so I, I didn't know who I was growing up and I'm still not quite sure who I am. And I'm 32 now. And what was, um, you know, I think that a lot of people like to sort of, uh, or no, I kind of asked at the beginning. Now let me refer to my notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you feel like, hold on. So, Given the amount of, of kind of personal stuff you were putting out there, did you feel alone in writing this book? You said you had help, but I don't know what, what you meant by help. Did you feel alone in the process? I found it to be one of the most profoundly alienating experiences of my life. Um, yeah, sure. I make documentaries for a living. I'm surrounded by smart, good people. It's incredibly collaborative and suddenly I was in this, like, you know, this basically this house in Queens with a, a window, um, just sort of tapping into um, tapping into the screen. And I had this quote above my desk. It said um, that my dad wrote literally in a Reddit AMA. It said, "Keep typing until it turns into writing." And oh, I love, that. love that. Let me ask you this: So uh, you you it's been what a year since all that you leave behind came yeah, out? Yeah, only one year. One year. Okay. Paperback is out now for those of you. And I cannot, I really cannot recommend this book enough. Um, knowing everything you know now, what would you have done differently in the process of writing the book? I just, I feel like I kind of lit some of my relationships on fire. Uh, I, you have, okay. Can I just say, you have to be, you have to be willing to do that. You, if you're, if it's going to be a truly unvarnished memoir, I think you have to be a, on some level willing to do that because one thing I can't read our, I've, and I've read a bunch of them because they cover politics, uh, is our political memoirs. Political memoirs, for the most part, to me, are unreadable because there's such little self-reflection, so much kind of um, maneuvering going on to make yourself look good or whatever. And to me, um, like doing um, doing that, like I, that's why, so to me, like you have to be willing to kind of be honest about your- What is more important, a book or your family? I mean, I specifically- 
talked about the sort of um, my father died. So there were basically um, relationships either um, grow through trauma or they break at the seams. Mm -hmm. And I found that my relationship with my stepmom, my dad's partner of literally 20 years, uh, we just couldn't, we could not see eye to eye. And I kept sort of referring that I, I needed softness from her and there was nothing there. And there, I remember I was sitting with my, one of my producers and we were at HBO and he brought up the book and he was just like, you know, you, you kind of went a little scorched earth on her. And I was like, oh God, I hope not. Like, this is my family. We have to be family forever. Right. Um, and so I think she, that- She did not take kindly. She did not take kindly to the book. It's well, I mean, she read it. I actually, well, she never told me if she sort of read it or not. But what I did is I have a twin sister who is awesome. And, uh, you know, she read it before. And I think that Jill was, uh, my stepmom, she was ultimately so graceful about it. Um, she came to all the events. I, I was able to do a, um, a talk with ta Coates and, and you know, she was there up there rooting as loudly as possible. So uh, someday, um, you know, if karma is true, um, someone will include me at something and I'll have to be like, all right, her, yep, got it. You ever consider blaming your twin sister for the stuff that she didn't like in the book? No, she, she wrote that, not me. Yeah, that's what I would have done. You got to play the twin card as much as possible, you know? Always. By the way, if anyone has questions, just put them in the chat. We're cool. Like, we're just chilling. We're, we're you know, we, we'll be here for hours if you want us to be. But, like, feel feel free to just jump in with questions if you guys have. I mean, one thing I wanted to specifically ask you while we're waiting if a question comes in is I, um, I think we are both deal with the same level of ambition. Be trying to be prolific, trying to get shit done. Uh, we're very, very true New Yorkers. I have this in my heart. I am totally motivated by my father. Um, and I hear him in my head saying, do it, come on, do it. There was almost, it, you're, you know, you had a very huge, like a very intense career so far. Who motivated you? What is internal motivation? What's going on there? If there is something that I need therapy for, it's probably that, because this is a question, if I'm in the shower, or if I'm walking by myself or I'm alone with my own thoughts, I think about this question a lot. Because, because I think when you come from the kind of household that you know I come from, where there's very little kind of guidance from your parents and-, and Our and positive everything. affirmation. That's what I heard none yeah. of. That's how our books yeah. are literally in, in, in inverse of each other. I was yeah. constantly in much too uh, sort of delusional reality that I was brilliant. And it was like you, there was just like this sort of simmering tension inside the household and just very like closed doors. Like, and yeah. then yet here you are and here you're doing this. I, I've, I've wondered how, I, I think you can go one of two ways. You can either, you know, come out of it, as you said, and the tension kind of breaks you at part of the seams and you don't, you don't know how to be a functioning adult or go the other way. And, and in my case, I'm very fortunate it came the other way. And I, you know, I got this question in, in a, a similar question in in one of my early interview ideas for the book, which was, which, which was you know what how is the trauma that you suffered as a child how did it manifest itself um, as an adult and I don't have an answer to that because I think I'm doing okay and I, I I'm thinking about it a lot I think the one thing I can think of is that I I'm motivated to not be to to avoid some of the mistakes of my parents. Mm -hmm and communicate and, and, and do, you know. So am I, but uh, I still make all those mistakes. Right, but also whatever toxicity was at home, my parents also had a lot of good attributes. Mm. My dad, you know, as he'll tell you, he has a story of a lot of other immigrants. He came to this country with not a lot in his pocket. Um, and, and, and then he, you know, got a job. He rose up in a career. You know, he worked really hard to make it as an electrical engineer. And he did, he made it. Whatever was going on at home, he made it in his career. He did really well for himself, um, and and then he you know eventually got laid off and he couldn't you know couldn't work anymore. But he he worked for 30, 40 years in the industry, doing well for himself. And I think he had a harder path than I did because he I didn't have to move to a new country. I grew up in a middle in middle class New Jersey, right? So growing up in middle class New Jersey, who's sorry. Um, that's someone calling with a question. No, uh, growing up in middle class New Jersey, I didn't have to like start from scratch. You know that in itself was privilege, right? Um, so all that all that is to say, um, I don't um, I don't um, I don't have a perfect answer for you, other than to say that I think I try to take the good parts of what my parents did, and 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 kind of cancel out, you know, the more challenging aspects. But where did the motivation come from? Do you have internal motivation? 
I, I honestly, I don't have an answer. And maybe, you know, I, I, I wish, I wish I did. I, I, because I do think about this. This is not like me trying to avoid it. I, I just think about it a lot. And in, I, I continue to draw blanks because I'm like, how did I get here? I have no idea. Um, I really think a part of it also might be that I, I've always felt like if I don't succeed, then where are you going to go? You don't have a backstop. Right. Oh my God, that's it. That's exactly what it oh. is. All right, well. Um, I felt the same way, like, and I we have two questions, getting excited, but I remember like I did three things right in a row because if I, if something doesn't go through, I don't have a safety net financially. Yeah. Um, it's just like, I have a scarcity complex as it relates to work. And so that makes you sort of hoard things. Right. And it just makes me so nervous to say no to things because that's sort of a financial imperative. But it's right. like, I'm not the same that I was five years ago and I was starting out. Right. Oh, we have a question. I don't see from who, but. Oh, okay, well, so, well. Um, so, so read, you read the question, Sopan. Okay. okay, Sopan, do you feel like you're still learning and discovering as you talk more about the book, interviews, crowdcasts, or has it all been said by now? Aaron, same for you after a year of your book being out. Um, I'm gonna answer first because I'm selfish. Uh, yes, I mean, that what Aaron, the conversation Aaron and I just had was interesting to me. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess definitely, because this is not an overnight process. This tracks a year of my life. That year was two years ago. I'm a different person now. And the way I listen to things is different. So yeah, 100%, Aaron? I, I did like 80 interviews um, and it was wild. And I really felt like I had to say something new every time. Um, and I also, I, I, I began to feel a bit of fatigue at talking. I'm, some of my book is about my alcoholism. I'm in recovery. I'm very grateful to be in recovery, but there was something, um, you know, I'm a professional person and I had to be really careful about what I said about, um, drugs or about alcohol or about those sort of things. And yet my book is about sort of recovering from alcoholism. And so I constantly had this very sort of specific voices in my head tell, but you know, but you know, you also have to be like thinking about what you're sharing. Um, and I don't think that, you know, you, you can't really censor if you're trying to sell a book. And so I had a, I had a cons, I had a bit of a struggle with it. And now when I'm asked to talk about the book, I'm so proud of it, but it's almost as if I want to talk about like my dad's book, or I want to talk about your book, or I want to talk about my dad has a new collection of essays that my stepmom put together, like I kind of want to further the work of David Carr. That is where my sort of special sweet spot is. But like, I, I know Sopan is gonna get to it. You get tired of talking about yourself after a while. People are like, all right, we heard enough from you. And you're like, yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I am, what I feel bad about, I shouldn't feel bad about it. I, you know, I do feel bad about the amount of hawking you have to do. Like, buy my book, buy my book, retweet this. Retweet that. I I do that. It's like, everyone's like, shut up. I know. <laughs> We well, don't have a book. book. If I you don't the book, like, I wouldn't have to keep doing this. So no, I I do feel kind of bad how much I have to clog people's feeds, but um, look, and then I go, well, you know what? Like, I'm not famous. You know, like Jessica Simpson comes out with a with a memoir. She doesn't have to like clog your feed. She's Jessica Simpson. There's a built-in tens of thousands of people that are going to buy that book and it becomes a bestseller. That's not the case for you and I. You know, so you and I have to work harder at it. Um, Try. Hi, Try. So nice to, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks so much for this talk. No, thank you for, thank you for joining us. It's wonderful. I'm wondering whether forgiveness was an intentional or inadvertent byproduct of your respective experiences in memoir writing. You take that one first. I think that forgiveness is a really import, important thing about being a human being. And um, I think absolutely I saw my dad's actions because it was like about, he was an incredible father, um, but he also had a lot of rough edges. He was very, very difficult. I mean, he wanted me to change the world. Um, and that is a really hard thing for a 21 year old who is a doofus to <laughs> out. Um, yeah. And so I think that there was a lot of forgiveness, but I think I personally, um, this is why the Sopan's book is, you know, really, I, I mean, I read it so quickly. I underlined it, underlined it, underlined it. Um, you know, I, I just can't seem to get there with my mother and it's been 17 years and I've just, you know, I, I've just been waiting for that moment of grace where I, I think I can do it, but I just haven't felt, I, I just, I don't know. There's something in me that stops me. Uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm seeing from others and I'm learning from others about how to do it. 
but I, I would say that I'm very much in the active part of understanding what is forgiveness and what is active forgiveness and what does that look like when you're uncomfortable? And she, you know, and, and I, I said this before, like, you don't have to, you know, like sometimes, sometimes it's the health, that's the healthy thing to do. You know, we, we, we see a lot of movies, right. And we see a lot of taking a lot of pop culture where we say, where we, where, 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 where forgiveness is like considered the mandatory thing to do. And that's like, you know, and that's not, that's not always the case. Um, you know, you're not necessarily the better or bigger person because you forgive someone. But aren't you more whole? Like, I think that imagine if you were too uncomfortable, you just could not connect with your dad. You could connect with your mom. Like you had to push yourself in order to do it. And you are a more whole person as a result. Totally. Yeah. Um, uh, could you, hi there. Hi, Sarah. Uh, could you each both speak about the moment you realize I have to write a book for some sharing via other media? Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I'm sure Aaron has a different answer. Well, actually, actually, you will like my answer to this. Um, so when I first started th th thinking about doing this, I was going to do it as a documentary um, because I spent most of my 20s doing documentary work. Um, you know, I worked at the Boston Globe in their documentary video unit um, at uh, a show called Rock Center with Brian Williams, which was all long form video producing and Al Jazeera, et cetera, CBS. So I, I was more comfortable um, um, you know, I, I was more comfortable doing it than that because that was what my expertise was in instead of doing it as a book. And then I thought uh, doing a camera, uh, doing an on-camera thing would have been a little intrusive for my parents because they're not the most like media literate people. You know, they don't, you know, they're not used to having cameras in their face. They're not used to being around that in a way that I am. And so I thought that that would have been a little difficult for them. So I thought I would just do it as a book. Um, so, and I'm glad I did because I, I think, I, I just, I just think the cameras would have been too much for them and a lot more logistics you have to worry about. I just think it ended up being better that way. Aaron, what about you? Um, people have approached me about doing, um, a documentary about my father. It is my preferred medium in which to make things. And, um, you know, I think there would have been a very good reason to do it as a doc. My dad wrote this book called the night of the gun, which was a New York times bestseller. Um, and it was beautiful and brutal and like, the top of the game. And so here I am who have, I've written maybe three articles. I'm like, Hmm, maybe I should write a book. And it's just like, there has to be some sort of delusion itself in order to do it. Um, but the thing is, um, the, the emails that he wrote me were what the book was. And so to do that as a documentary, I think would be a disservice. And yeah. I think that a lot of the, uh, you know, people who read my book, there's just this really intense feeling of jealousy. That's what I really get. People said, I didn't have a father like your father. I wasn't told that I was special. Um, and How does that make you feel when you hear that from people? It makes me feel a little bit like you missed the point, but also I totally understand and I get it and I feel you and I understand and I wish you had a parent like that. Um, you know, I think I have these like sort of split yeah. emotions. And, and in the book for what it's worth, you don't come off as someone who doesn't understand the weight of having David Carr as your father. It's not like there's no point where it's not clear that you're not appreciative. You yeah. I, I think that it's, it's a, I wanted to create something. If you want David Carr advice on how to nail the internship, how to negotiate your salary, how to um, stop drinking alcohol, how to be a good partner, um, how to be, uh, um, you know, how to help somebody else. Um, what to do it when your source relationship is bothering you, who to reach out to. I mean, I could keep all this stuff to myself. And uh, I, I, you know, I think just like putting it in this book, I think was a way to share a little bit more of him. And if you want access to those thoughts and sort of, yeah. that's what it was about. Um, and just like, I just, yeah, I, I so much feared him being forgotten because um, he died so early in his life. And I think that it was just, I made a promise to him. I would, I'm always going to champion his work in the way that he championed me. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Abhishek has a question. Hello, Sopan. What would you have done differently if you were your parents bringing up a family in America? Oh, that's a great question. I haven't been asked that. Um, wow, that's a great question. What would I have done differently? I, I, I want to be careful in answering that because hindsight is twenty twenty, and part of the issue was that my parents were mismatched from the start, you know, uh, 15 years before I was born. So, you know, so, but I really think that communication is really important. And that's not something I think a lot of immigrant parents are good at. 
and talking about emotions and feelings. And, you know, um, I wasn't good at it. You know, my parents weren't good at it. You know, my brother wasn't good at it. Uh, I, I think it's, I think communication can lead to warmth. And so I would say, generally speaking, I would I wish we would have communicated a lot more and, and understood that life is as much about relationships and social development as much as it is about like your resume or academic achievement. Um, so I'm going to have a better answer as I think about that more, but that, that's, that's my answer for now. Um, okay. Here's another question. Hi, Jay. Hi, Sopan. What would you say is re what would you say reading is, is reading you hope people who, sorry, hold on. Oh, sorry. I can't, can't read. What would you say is something you hope people who read this book will understand better? Uh, did your audience affect your writing or did you mostly approach it as externalization of your internal process with revisiting your relationship with your parents? Um, I, 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 I think that this book is, I, I was worried at first as I wrote it, that this book would be like very narrow. It's only, only brown people will understand it. And I, I actually think that this book is for anyone who has a relationship um, with someone that should be better, that they think should be better. Not, again, with the caveat that not everyone deserves that. And I hope that if you're reading this book and you're interested in bridging a gap, that this is just one story of one person in one family that tried it. And here are the results. Um, and that result is not an overnight success. It's not even necessarily a success, but it's a process. It's, we're in the process. And I hope that, um, and I hope that, uh, that, that continues. Um, and as part of your second question, did my audience affect your writing? Um, no, uh, you know, we, this, what makes this book, I think, different than other books is that it truly does capture a year very authentically. When I was writing chapter four, I had no idea what chapter nine was going to look like. So a lot of these reactions you're capturing from me are in real time. All the quotes you see are recorded or they're on camera. There are recreations of real events that happen, you know, um, almost word for word. Um, so no, like it really, everything, everything unfolds as, exactly as it happened and they are now if i wrote that book today and went on that journey today it would be a different book because it's i'm a different person now so i i, I it, nothing external affected it it was more just you know documenting everything along in the process um actually i'd like to ask aaron that question too how did you did you did you did you view how did you yeah answer that i don't want to really read the whole question but I mean, I was writing for, um, you know, early to mid twenties. I was writing as a, an instruction manual. I, um, I definitely was very conscious of the audience while I was writing it. Um, in the same way that I am about all of my sort of documentaries. I mean, I tend to make work that very, very much skews female. I would say my, my, um, without it being reported, I mean, it probably is 70, 30 in terms of people watching it. And so I think that, the sort of feminine inquiry has already always been a part of my book, but that's, but then I love people like you who read it and it's like, you're not a lady, you're not an early twenties lady. Well, Wesley was, Wesley was the, was the first one. Exactly. I also say that I think for a memoir, I think it's really important to, um, oh, that's right. Uh, anyway, sorry. I think it's really important for, uh, and I totally lost my train of thought because I just looked at that chat. Um, oh, uh, what, what was I going to say? I'm so sorry, uh, Jay. I had a, I had a really profound thought. And I know it was good, and it, it is totally left my mind because I looked at the chat. Um, um, uh, Jesus. Anyway, anyway, sorry, Aaron. Please, please continue. I mean, I you know we were talking about audience, and so it was that Wesley oh, was. Right. Now I remember. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to say that I think that when you're writing a memoir, I think you should write it as much as you can for an audience of one, which is yourself. Are you happy with it? Are you proud of it? Are you comfortable with it at, at the end process? Because everything else is out of your control, whether people like it or not like it, because, you know, you can have 10 good read reviews. Eight of them might be good, but there's Joan from Kansas. That's like, you know, this is a, uh, this is not what I thought I was getting. And it's not very good. My good read reviews were so brutal like were they? so mean they were like necrotizing your dead daddy's corpse and i was like yeah. Yeah. god like it was just um i've saved them and one time i um there was this amazing somebody somebody really really hated me and they said that i was the kind of person that would be at a party with you and i'd be talking to you but looking at somebody better to have a conversation with <laughs> just like, oh my god like it was the most brutal personal Shit, I have uh, truly ever experienced. And one night, I, I didn't know Goodreads got that mean. 
I mean, it just, you know, it's that sort of, it's that slimy person that is never trying to connect with you, is always trying to connect with somebody else, is like a faker, is, a, you know, opportunist, is a climber. It's like social climbing. Um, well, I'm going to go. Okay. First of all, everybody, please leave a Goodreads review for, uh, for both of us. I will send you $5. Yeah. Well, yeah, I will. I will send me your Venmo and I will send you that. I'm happy to. Wow. That is wild. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. Anyone has any follow-up questions? Barbara says $6. Oh, you that drive is a tough much. bargain, Barbara. You drive a tough bargain. Um, um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, we, you know, we're going to be here for a couple, uh, a couple of, a couple more minutes and, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, thank you know, Aaron, do you have any final thoughts? So how, uh, what is it like when the paperback comes out? Are you over it by now? Like, is it like, is it, is it one of those things that you're excited about or are you, are you kind of, are you not done? That's not the word, but like, were you looking, let me put it this way. Were you excited for the paperback to come out? There's something insanely magical about holding something tangible in yeah. your hands um, that you made. And I will never get that with a documentary. That's a CD, it exists online. Um, and so when I, I had a moment where I was looking at it and um, you know, a lot of people, uh, a couple of people that I really admire gave me pull quotes. Um, that means that's the quotes on the back of the book. And I just like, I just was, I felt so insanely grateful. And there were, there's been a lot of moments of uh, being ungrateful and like, you know, I didn't get a times review. I, there's all these things that I really wanted that, uh, you know, like I think we all start to be like once on the times bestseller list. And I, you know- Aaron, and it, rub it in, jeez, rub it in. I wasn't on it, what do you mean? I absolutely was not on it. Um, um, I have like, uh, so I think that I lost myself when I was putting a book out about these milestones that I had to pick. And it was like, you know what? You got to put a goddamn, gosh darn book out there. And so when I got the paperwork, the paperback, it was just like, it all came rushing back to me about this is incredible. And uh, what, you know, what a beautiful privilege it's been. Yeah, right. I love that. That's great. Uh, Sarah has another question. Um, you spoke about writing it as it happened. Can you both speak about the value of writing things as they happen versus waiting to let it simmer? Uh, the stuff I know yours was a physical journey that lent itself to real time documentation. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, oh, and then Barbara asked, did your parents ever suggest pressure you to have a arranged marriage? I'm going to answer that one first. Cause that's a really quick answer. The answer is no, because we really didn't speak growing up. So like there was never a conversation about dating. We barely spoke. So that never, that never entered the, entered the discussion. Um, to Sarah's question, uh, I, I'll go first. I think about this a lot, how I would have how the book would have been different if I just waited at the end of the year and then put everything together. Um, uh, and I don't know the answer. It might've been better. It might've been worse. I don't know. It would have, it, it was different than the, the mission I kind of gave myself in trying to um, arc this. Um, um, it might've been, you know, as, because I would have had more context. I do think in the course of the book, I do think I become a better writer as the book goes on because I'm maybe I'm more mature as the book goes on. I'm more confident in my writing, whatever. Uh, and that probably would not have happened if I let it simmer. But on the other hand, I do think I, I, I like that the book is different than other books because it does, you know, as I said, it's like a documentary in book form, right? So I do feel it's genuine in that respect. Aaron, what about you? I, I've like basically did it as a, like a construction. I tagged all of my dad's emails and then basically like did a storyboard and plot pointed it between so it's all sort of after it happened um and i think that i remember i included sort of like a present day chapter in my um in my early drafts my editor and it was about being in the hospital and being sick and that i didn't have a parent to help me um and you know she was just like this does not fit tonally with the book this is we're on a journey with you we're, we're seeking closure and this doesn't represent any sort of closure um i took my book down from like eighty thousand to sixty thousand words i mean we really sort of uh we really cut the sort of the fat out of the book um and mm. uh so really uh because i trust i trusted you know my editor and you know pamela cannon at random house and I just, you know, I rem I know when books are dragging on and it's like, I want to sort of understand this journey. And so a lot of it was documenting after the fact. And I think that was absolutely the right move. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, Aaron, uh, I, you know, I'm just going to reiterate this. Uh, I, I think your book is fantastic, and, and thank you for writing it. I want to have one last question for you, which is, did you get any – what kind of – what was the best message you got from a stranger after mm -hmm. your book came out? I got so many that were so incredible. Is there one that stands out? I'll try to, um, there's, I mean, I helped like get a bunch of people sober, um, uh, which I think that it just was, it just was so amazing to sort of, um, to really think about this. And how long had you been sober when the book came out? I was sober for, I think, uh, uh, basically around four years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll try to find a good one, but what, you know, what book stuff taught me is I was a very average consumer of books and I often bought a lot of stuff on Amazon and I was like, Oh, this is easy. And so I want to sort of plug, um, to Brookline Booksmith. Like I remember me, uh, like putting a book out and working with the local bookstores and understanding sort of the, the climate that is facing bookstores and how special they treat authors, um, what it was like. I mean, I did, um, you know, uh, I did all of my talks at I think pretty much like local places. And it really, um, I, I just didn't understand the industry before I put a book out. And then when people, when my friends or anybody I know is putting a book out, I feel so much solidarity. I'm doing retweets, I'm figuring it out, put it in the story. Yeah, yeah. Like, same, I just, same, I same, same. And Very it's just nice. like, you know, I think that uh, we're so self-conscious about, uh, about being those sort of people that slime people's feeds. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> that, I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I mean, think about, it's just like, it's so important more so now than ever. Like I make documentaries for HBO and Netflix and I encourage people turn off the fucking television, like read a book, like let's right, yeah, get right. into a story um, that, you know, that doesn't have a phone next to you. And it's almost as if we have to really uh, retrain our, our brains, how to read books. And the, the, when I was writing my book, I read 30, 35 books. Like I just was constantly mm -hmm. reading and that's yeah. why the book, you know, got there. Amazing. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, who are your top five NBA players of all time? All right, I got this. Uh, LeBron, MJ, Larry, Wilt, and I'll go Bill Russell. Please don't hold me to that or get me yelled at on Twitter for this. Um, well, uh, I, we have I, one more, I... We have one more question. So, Pam, what are your thoughts on Hot Priest? I'm a fan. Uh, Fleabag is a great show. Um, I, I mean, I actually want to, want to say I've gotten a lot of messages from strangers as well, and that's the best part about this process. I mean, easily, you know, whatever you know, I have no idea if we'll ever make a bestseller list or how many copies we'll sell, but we've gotten a lot of messages you know, from people being like, "This is my story." I one one woman wrote me this week asking if I could send her the, a list of questions that I asked my parents so that she can ask her parents the same thing, and I was like. That's, it's just like, you know, people writing essays. It's just the most meaningful, sweetest thing. And that's been the best part of the process. So I hope, I hope, you know, I, even if this book does not sell another copy, I'm going to be satisfied by how this went. Um, with that being said, please, everybody, buy the book. <laughs> um, but thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm, I'm so grateful that we've met and we've become friends through this process and we've, we've shared, you know, the mutual experience of writing and promoting a book. I'm so glad. Uh, and I hope everyone, you know, everyone should read your book. I really think it's essential reading and I hope, I hope uh, that happens. Well, I think um, what I was, what I've been reminded of watching you go through the process is there's a way to do this with grace and there's a way to be ungraceful. And uh, I think that you're really sort of walking that line. And I, you know, we didn't get into it, but it's just like, you're putting a book out during an epidemic. And I think that um, it's just one of the craziest all time times to be putting out a book. So uh, in, in all solidarity to you, um, it's a very big deal. And uh, it's a very, very good book. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you to all the, uh, and Nina, my old roommate, if you're still here, thank you. Adam, welcome back, man. Hi. Thank you guys so much. That was wonderful. And thank hey, you for God, you got there. Oh my God. I was so nervous. I literally turned red from it at the spot. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. Echo. What it are we going to do? But we got there. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care.
And so please go to uh, buy the book from yeah. Brookline from Bookline, Booksmith, from Brookline Booksmith. Uh, Shop Little Indie, right there. and it, it's like a shiny thing. And then whenever you're thinking about buying books, um, it's like um, there's really just type it in like, you know, the, the local bookstore near you, specifically this one. So it really, really helps us all out in a very serious way. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Well, good night.